முழங்கட்டும் எங்கள் போர்ப்பறை முழக்கம்
Your nation may have food sovereignty and there can be millions of people starving. They said beyond food sovereignty, beyond an imagined food security, we believe in food justice. The concept of food justice. The producer shall not go hungry. Okay? What it meant was, now Kudumbashri actually, many of those Sangha Krishis are very profitable. They have made money. They have added income to the women. But how, what is the, the principle on which they revolve is like this. Suppose there are 18 women in a collective, in a Sangha Krishi. Suppose they produce 1000 quintals of paddy or whatever they produce. But it is usually food crop. There are some cat crop producers, but it's mainly food crop. If the, um, the, the, you can sell your thousand quintals or whatever on the market. You can do that. But you cannot sell a single kilogram on the market until the needs, requirements and demands of those 18 families are met. Only after you meet the demands of those 18 families, what is left the real surplus that you can sell on the market. So the producer shall never go hungry. Right? Because look at look, in the last 30 years of covering farming, and look, here is something that is so tragic for me. In the 80s, early in the 80s and even early 90s, when I started journalism and was going to farm. The first thing I would be met with in a farm was a glass of milk in a silver tumbler. It was very important to people, whether in Pudukote or wherever it was, it was important that they gave you milk. The silver tumbler was also a little status symbol. It was their pride. Milk, fresh milk would be given to you to a visitor to the farm. In the late 90s, the silver tumbler disappeared. In the, in the mid 90s, the silver tumbler disappeared. In the late 90s, the milk disappeared. <laughs> the silver tumbler was replaced by a broken cup. In the late 90s, the milk gave way to chai, to tea. By late 2000, by, by, by early 2000s, the chai gave way to black tea. Now, there is nothing in many of the farm households because in millions of Indian farm households, the children don't get to drink milk. Every drop of milk goes to the market. If they have any milk, they are selling it to buy other necessities. So children are growing up on farms. It's very hard for us to conceive of this idea that the children of farmers don't get to drink milk. That's why that Kudumbashri principle that the producer shall have the first claim. Now what has happened? Oh, by the way, uh, in fact, their situation on credit is different from farmers anywhere in the country. The Kudumbashri women have handled credit brilliantly because of their collective strength. They are getting together, they are making a success of farming. Do you know that in many villages in Kerala, in many villages in Kerala, the local Kudumbashri is the biggest depositor in the bank. Okay, in your village, the Kudumbashri unit will be the biggest depositor or in the first four to five deposits. Now that means there is a limit to how much the bank manager can misbehave with you. Okay. Now you can demand the best rates, the best treatment, the most favorable treatment clause if you like. You can demand that. If you are giving it to this shop, to this uh, owner of the general stores and to the owner of the uh, car showroom, 
they must also get equally good terms. When you become the biggest depositor in the branch, your, the terms of trade between you and the bank, bank because it's, I, I, she can always pull out and go to another bank. Now what has happened is, they have been devastated by the floods. They are appealing for recognition of what has happened to them. They are telling me that the losses are between, between estimated losses of the Kudubashri are between 400, just the Sagra Krishis, the 70,000, 400 and 600 crores. And look at these women, having lost 600 crores, the very same women in the last three weeks, seven crores for the CM's relief fund. I am appealing to every one of you to go on to that CM's relief fund and make a donation. You know, it was the first time in the 18 years I have known the Purimishri that they have ever rung up to ask for help and money. They have always in the past, hundreds of times, rung me up to say, come and see what we have done. Come and see our new experiment. Come and see our new farm in Vayana. Come and see this, what, what our group in Aleppi has achieved. This is the first time they have ever rung up to say, we are in distress. Help us. So I really want you to know that this is also a farming crisis. The most progressive farmers in the country, the farmers who are the 70,000 Sangha Krishis who use the least amount of chemicals and pesticides, who really try, who, one of the reasons they have been successful and even financially successful is by eliminating pesticides with high input of chemical fertilizer, they have broken out of the high cost economy that farmers are trapped in. Okay? They have gone in for a, they have broke with the high cost economy, lowered their input costs so substantially that their margin of profit has been better. The Kudumbashri needs our help. And as I said, in 18 years, I have not had a call from Kudumbashri asking me for help. These are the sort of people they are. They have not ever asked for help. They have always said, come and see what we have done. Come and address us, do the keynote at our annual conference. It's just an amazing chapter in Indian agriculture and its experience. Please, when you return tonight, get on to the, get, go online, go to the Kerala Chief Minister's Relief Fund and make some contribution. Ask all your friends to make some contribution. The, um, you know, every one of those slides that Gopinath put out so succinctly, so clearly, also part of much wider canvas democratic struggles and demands. Like, take the slide on water. Okay. The minute you get into any one of those recommendations, you are going to find a hundred other things happening around water, which you are going to have to deal with. Who owns water? Is water a fundamental right or a commodity? All sorts of things. It is the greatest site of Indian inequality. How do we address that? So there are lots and lots of each of those points refers to a collage of highly complex issues. And therefore you, we need to also develop a larger or a wider understanding, a wider canvas. It's astonishing how much those five reports are, in fact, the fifth report in two volumes. It's astonishing how much they've covered. 
you know, but they have done it from the prism of agriculture, which has to fit into the prism of Indian democracy and the, the Indian nation state. Now, about the agrarian crisis itself, I have been saying for a while now that what we call the agrarian crisis has gone far beyond the agrarian. What we call rural distress has gone beyond the rural. Now, in your, when I came in, I was fascinated to hear what Venkin and Bharti had to say. Your own sector. To me, I am citing more often the example of the IT sector than the farming sector to show what a fraud neoliberal economics is. The basic principles of this of neoliberal capitalism and economics and in fact of capitalist economics is that what have they been saying all every year? You want to create jobs. To create jobs, what must you do? A. You must lower taxes. B. You must give incentives to the employers. You must have low taxes or no taxes. Plus you must give subsidies and incentives. C. You must allow hire and fire exit policies. When you do this, the successful capitalist will be encouraged to spend much more money and create much more investments and create many more jobs. Have you not all heard this philosophy? Okay. How does it apply to the IT sector? 20 years tax holiday. They gave them 20. No, I don't know where else in the world the IT sector, I mean, I visited Redmond, Seattle of Microsoft, I've read, visited various HP and others, where people are given hundreds of acres to build golf courses in Bengaluru, land taken from farmers at 50,000 rupees an acre, value is 5 crores, and then IT complexes build golf courses and conference centers on that land. I don't know many other places in the world where that happens. If you go to the Tokyo and the business district of Tokyo, Ginza, highly advanced electronics and IT centers. There will be thousands of employees in one building. That's it. They've got no huge campuses because Japan doesn't have the space for huge campuses. It's got such a high tech. They now are opening campuses like that in Thailand and elsewhere in China, but not in Japan. So, anyway, 20 years tax holiday. Then, subsidized land, all kinds of incentives. And as the tax holiday got over, you converted that into the SEZ model. Hmm. The park, food park, IT park, whatever. Hmm. So those incentives came. And then you gave higher and higher uh, freedom. And in 2017, what my friends in the free software movement, Switch and elsewhere, informed me, the top seven IT companies made a pre-tax profit of 23,000. And how many jobs did they create? They laid off 56,000 employees. Those who made a profit of 23,000 crores laid off 56,000 employees. So where was all that economics mantra? Give us hire and fire. Give us incentives like land. Give us uh, you know tax holiday, low tax, no tax, whatever, and we'll create jobs. You did exactly the opposite because there is never an enough making money. There's no, no, no amount of money is ever enough. 
So that's the danger of profit. So and that that kind of those kind of economic policies are all encompassing. That's why I said, hey, the agrarian crisis has gone beyond the agrarian. For many years, we counted the agrarian crisis in terms of lives lost, in terms of production lost, in terms of years lost to Indian agriculture, opportunities lost. For me now, for the last several years, I'm saying, the agrarian crisis is no longer just a measure of how many lives have been lost. It's a measure of that because when 310,000 farmers have committed suicide in 20 years, of course it's a measure of distress. But it's no longer a measure, crisis is no longer a measure of just that, of how many lives have been about our loss of lives, it's no longer a measure about of just our loss of production. It is today a measure also of our loss of our humanity. The shrinking boundaries of our humanness that we could sit quiet for 20 years and not really protest or be worried when 3 lakh 10,000 human beings take their lives. We were comfortable with that. We were willing to live with that. What does it say about what has been lost? It tells me there is a serious shrinking of the boundaries of our humanity, of our loss of humanness. That today is to be what the agrarian crisis is capturing. That is what it is pressure. Now, the farm crisis, which is at the core of that, that is an extremely serious thing. And you saw the very first, the five, six points that were made. Um, that, that covers it. The complications have come in a number of ways. By the way, some of the, some of the best points made in that presentation some of those points have been seized and seized on and captured by corporations. So, like for instance, now you will find Mr. Nilakani is making statements yesterday, the day before. They see the soil card and the creation of a huge database around it as a huge bonanza for the IT sector. So we need to discuss, should that soil card be a public investment or a private sector? No? Should, who should be getting these? Who should be getting You know, one little thought, I'm digressing, but because of Kudumbashri and Reiki here, I want, I want to make one point. The Kudumbashri women did what they did by forming collectives using their bargaining power. As Belkin told you, you know, united we fight, you know, united we bargain or divided we beg. I personally think, I may be wrong, but I think IT is a very good sector for co-ops because there are no gigantic infrastructures required. There are no huge factories required. I really think groups of you can form co-ops and give those big companies a run for their money. Small group, forming as collectives, forming your associations counter to NASCAR, you can't really give these guys because they can you can never they can never beat you for innovation, thinking on your feet. After all, you were doing it for them. Do you know? Now also, please see one more part of that economics. Look at the people who are getting laid off. What many of you are my old friends. Earning a particular sum and having three different EMIs to settle each month. Education loan, car loan, house loan. 
What do you do after laying them off? You replace them with fresh out of college graduates at one third, one fourth the salaries that these people who gave 10 years, 15 years of loyalty to their companies and are then laid off. Think about the collective bargaining, think about collectives itself. It's a possibility in the IT sector. It doesn't require that kind of gigantic investment and infrastructure that many other sectors in industry do. It's worth considering. Back to having a great look. I want to tell you also what's been happening on the numbers front of farm. Of farm suicides. The numbers you are reading in your newspaper that Maharashtra had 1,286 suicides in 2016, falling to 1,100 in 2017. Do you know whose numbers these are? Which government department's numbers they are? NCRP is a division of the Union Home Ministry. The numbers you are reading in the papers are from the Revenue Department of the State Government. Why Revenue Department? Why not Agriculture Department? Because farmers suicides are counted through the prism of how much compensation has to be paid. So you put that in the hands of the Revenue Department, it will reduce 1000 suicides to 300 or 200 because they don't want to pay that compensation to the farmers. <coughs> You will find that in 20 years of data, now the more authentic, that there have always been three parallel sets of data. One is revenue department, whose figures are always the lowest. The second is the arbitrary replies made in times of crisis by the chief minister's office or the chief minister on the floor of the assembly. Something that his secretaries have hooked up the previous night and they will read that out there. The third was the National Crime Records Bureau. Now please do not think, because I am going to say nice things about the NCRT, do not think that its data was not flawed. The National Crime Records Bureau had a lot of flaws, but those were not, those were not sins of commission. They were not flaws introduced by the NCRP in the data. They are the flaws of your society. If the policeman will not accept the woman as a farmer, but will say she is a farmer's wife, that is the prejudice of your society. That's who you are as a society. So, thousands and thousands of women's farmer's suicides are not counted. They are counted as women's suicides. They are counted as housewife's suicide. Typically, they are counted as housewife's suicide. Go and look at the breakup of who those housewives are and where they came and what they were doing. They are all rural women. Hugely, they are full of rural women, young rural women between 14 and 29, all of whom had something to do with farming. Then, Another way of disappearing these figures, especially for that 14, 16 age group, I have personally visited the households and documented the suicides of young girls in high school, junior college. What happens with them? They are studying, their brother is studying, farming family, their parents are farmers, they are great crisis destroys the parents. What they do, they withdraw the girl from college. They withdraw the girl from school. Her brother is a very mediocre student. The girl is top of her class. But in the prejudices of our society, when you are cutting, spending, what do you do? You take the girl out of college. That 14 year old who is going to top her high school, like in Anathapur, several, she commits suicide. Now that is going to be registered as student suicide. 
she did not come. Student suicides are very often committed under the pressure of exams, under the pressure of bad performance. Here the girl is stopping her school. She did not, she committed suicide driven to it by an agrarian crisis that destroyed her family's livelihood. She is a victim of the agrarian crisis, but she will not be counted as such. She will not be acknowledged ever. Thousands of the largest group committing suicide in this country is women and rural women. Okay? That is the biggest group. But in, in the, in the uh, patriarchal lexicon, she is not a farmer, she is a farmer's wife. Now here is also another very peculiar thing. The bulk of work on the fields is done by women. You can go by it sector by sector. Paddy transplantation. How many men have you ever seen go paddy transplantation? 90% and above is done by women. Dairy, livestock care. The, the, the average, the estimate range from 69% to 93% done by women in different parts of the country. <coughs> now, by the way, as migrations have taken place on an unparalleled scale in this country, as millions of men, even if they have not migrated out of the village, migrate out of the occupation of agriculture, the load on many, many women that I know and have covered has doubled. Now they are looking after the livestock, after the cattle, after the poultry and crop agriculture. Everything is coming on that person. It's like being in a pressure cooker. And if the male has migrated out of the village, she is then handling, which she always did, the education of the children, sending them to school. She is handling the money for them. She is handling the bank manager. And she is doing all the damn farming work. You know, I mean, her husband might have committed suicide or he may have gone to a big city looking for work. So the pressure on women in agriculture is becoming terrible. And especially, the older women are now coming under serious pressure because younger women are coming into this. Younger men also are coming into it. You know that in the last 20 years, if you look at the 19, 2011 census and the 1991 census, the number of numbers which my two friends here have helped me put together, analyzed for me, much all my work on this, the data was supported by their analysis. Rukmini and Gopina. If you look, in 2011 census, there are 15 million fewer farmers than there were in 1991. You know what that means? It means you are losing full-time farmers at the rate of more than 2,000 every 24 hours. Yeah, do the math. Between 91 census and 2001 census, Farmers or main cultivator fell by 7.2 million in the numbers you calculated so kindly for me, put together for me. Uh, in the between 2001 and 2011 census, the number of farmers declined by 7.7 .7 million. That's 14.9 million. Now please divide 14.9 million. By 20 years, by 365, you get your number. It will be something like 2038. Something like that. Every 24 hours. Now, where are those farmers going? In the census, there is a there is a, a document, a table called primary, an Excel sheet called primary census abstract 
brackets agriculture. As the, as the column of farmers is plummeting, that is main cultivation. I'll explain it a little later what is a main, main, okay, main cultivator, the person whom we understand as a farmer is somebody who has operated a piece of land. There is no gender ascribed by the census. It may be a man, it may be a woman. There is no, um, what do you call it, land size, unit size of land ascribed. It can be half an acre, it can be 100 acres. But if you have operated that piece of land for 180 days or more, six months or more, then you are a main cultivator. Because it means that you are dependent on that occupation for your main income. You are, if you, if you took away that six months of work, you would be finished. You are dependent on agriculture or cultivation as an occupation. There are people who don't do six months in the year. Maybe they do three, four months. They are called marginal cultivators. Main cultivator, marginal cultivator. Okay. Now, why do you see you? Why do we need to have number of days? If you don't have something sensible by way of number of days of work, every corporate CEO will become a farmer because he has a great great vineyard in Nashik and he goes every Sunday from Bombay to Nashik by car to tend his vineyards from which he is going to make wine and market and sell. Every, you know that in this country, in Maharashtra, Amitabh Bachchan registered as a farmer <laughs> because he wanted to buy Adivasi farmland in Mulshi Dam. So what he did, it's restricted land. You can't, everybody can't buy agricultural land. He brought a certificate from his Tehsildar in Uttar Pradesh showing that his family owned farmland over there and therefore he is a farmer. <laughs> Luckily, it got so much attention because he is Amitabh Bachchan and it got stuck and they had to turn it down. But hundreds of other lesser celebrities have managed it successfully. They are sitting on farmland using your Delhi farmhouse. What is the distinguishing feature of the farmhouse culture in Delhi? Everything happens there except farming. <laughs> Wedding, parties, VIP visits, resorts, everything happens there except farming. So, you have this main cultivator that has decided, fallen, plummeted by 15 million. Where did they go? They didn't all commit suicide. They didn't all go to the cities. Where are the jobs? But you can see one thing. As the, where did they go? Look at the next column. Look two columns down in the same Excel. As the number of farmers has collapsed, the number of agricultural workers is exploding. In my home state, which is, which in the census, it is still the unified state of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana and Andhra. Between 2001 and 2011, in 10 years, number of main cultivators of farmers <coughs> collapsed by 1.3 million. Number of agricultural laborers goes up 34 lakhs. Now, that is an even more interesting thing. The fall in the number of farmers only accounts for one third of the growth in the number of laborers. What does it mean? It means that all other sections of agrarian society have also been devastated. Tailors, mochis, cobblers, weavers, spinners, Fishermen, they've all gone. Okay. So the number of landless agricultural laborers is exploding in those columns. 
but the number of main cultivators is going down. Another interesting thing, I spent three, four weeks in Punjab in May, the great agricultural miracle of India, deep in distress, deep in misery. And all the agricultural laborers I interviewed, Punjabis, I'm talking, I interviewed the Punjabi agricultural laborers, not the Bihari ones. Almost all those whom I interviewed, those agricultural laborers, two years ago, five years ago, six years ago, they were farmers. They had land. They've lost the land. They've lost the land to the money lender. They have lost the land to acquisition by corporations through government because the government's job today is to be the gunda for the corporations. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it is the corporate governance. So it looms for people and that's what it does. So you, many of those agricultural, it's consistent with what the census is showing us. Many of those people in the agricultural laborers' column were yesterday's farmers. Me, I look at all this group as farmers, far, landed farmers and landless farmers. That's, for me, those agricultural laborers are landless farmers. They don't farm. So you have seen this deadly decline in the number of cultivators and the consequent increase in the pressure on those still remaining on the farm, which includes millions and millions of them. By the way, let me tell you one more thing about the beauty of, uh, the, of, of the patriarchal area. In three, four states, the number of cultivators went up. In big states like Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Assam, the number of cultivators did not fall in went up. And imagine how progressive many of the new cultivators recorded were women. That is really progressive. Except that the women don't know it. What, what happened was in the land registration cost, the government introduced one third rebate or 40% rebate also. If the land is registered in the name of the woman, everybody raced to the Tashindar to register some of his land in his wife's name, in his mother's name. Most of those women are not aware of this change in their status. See, suppose the land registration cost per acre Maharashtra 12,000 rupees. You are given a rebate of 4,000. If you own 10 acres, you are saving. 40,000 rupees. So I'll put it in my wife's name. On, on the face of it, the data looks like something very progressive is happening in society. And Maharashtra's males are becoming so enlightened. All that's happened is, it's just like your micro credit, where millions of men are taking, before sick their wives, to take loans to support their drinking habits. So this kind of chaos is on in the farm sector. Then you have the situation where um, the entire MSP issue came up. But let's look at one more of those slides, the water issue. I am arguing that India is not suffering from a drought. There are droughts, there are floods also put in Canada. Those happen. What you have is a mega water crisis. It's a mega water crisis. If you have 10 good monsoons in a row, you will still have a mega water crisis because the way water is being captured, colonized, grabbed, by the rich and the elite is going to provide a permanent crisis for the poor. Let me give every one of you every year. Do you not see the photographs in the magazines, the channels, newspapers of long queues of poor women standing near a tanker in Marathwada 
Parapara is the favorite place for such photographs. It will always give you good photographs. So in summer, all the TV crews head for Aurangabad, Marathwada. Now, do you know what the cost of water per liter is for those women? It is hard to calculate, but I'll tell you why it's hard to calculate. At the beginning of the scarcity season, that woman is paying 45 paisa per liter in our world. At the peak of the scarcity season, that poor woman is paying 1 rupee per liter, 1 rupee per liter of water. However, her cost is much higher than that because she has spent 4 hours, 6 hours standing in queues to get that water. What about the cost of possible opportunity, earnings that she has lost by standing 6 hours in the queue? Not one queue. She will go to four different areas to get some water and spend three hours here, two hours there, one hour there, and like that. My friends, in the very same area, in the very same area where that poor woman pays one rupee per liter of water in the Aurangabad, Maratwada area, are 24 beer and alcohol factories which pay 4 paisa per liter even today. And that's a huge improvement. Till 5 years ago, before a lot of us made noise and somebody took them to court, they were for 30 years paying 1 paisa per liter. Why do you think Coke and Pepsi love India? They love India because they get water for 3 paisa, 5 paisa per liter. They will, do you think they'll be able to extract what are this way in California? Forget it. Forget it. They can come here and loot your water. They can go to Fiji. There's a, there is a branded bottle of water called Fiji, which is the costliest term. It comes out of Fiji and no one in Fiji can afford it. Now, guys, another thing. Speaking of the farm crisis and price, price crash, Maharashtra today, the price, the private purchase price, because incidentally, cooperatives account for less than 4 to, there are estimates 4% to 10% of milk purchase of milk in market. Under 10%, there are many who say 1%. So if you count the private purchase of milk, do you know what is the price of 1 liter that the farmer gets? 17 rupees per liter, which is cheap, which is cheaper than one bottle of bisleri costing 20 rupees. Milk is cheaper than water. <coughs> Milk is cheaper than water. Okay, and in a state which had had, especially in Western Maharashtra, a huge dairy sector. That's why you're seeing farmers in Maharashtra rioting, coming on the streets in protest, marching from Nashik to Mumbai because their prices have completely collapsed. Imagine that you can buy bisleri for 20 rupees a bottle, in summer it can become 22 and you can buy milk and pay the farmers 70 rupees a litre. So that's Another water park. Gigantic transfers are taking place in water, which have an incredible role in the agrarian crisis. There are transfers from rural to urban, poor to rich, agriculture to industry, food crop to cash crop and lifestyle, sorry, livelihoods to lifestyle. In the same Maharashtra which speaks of the worst drought in 70 years, multi-storied buildings are coming up in Mumbai, Pune, Barabati, elsewhere. Buildings that have, and I feel like later I can show you the photograph, a swimming pool on every floor. So there is 
if you want to look up on mobile phones, look for Aquaria Grande Balcony Swimming Pools. It's in Borivili, Maharashtra. After I wrote, they took out most of the photos of the swimming pools. But they are interested and I have the pictures with me. Now imagine there are two buildings in that complex. Each is 37 floors. And they are joined by the builders and so 75 floors, okay? 37, 37, 1. So on one side alone, there are going to be 75 balcony swimming pools. Now, if the same flats are located on the other side, that means in one complex you have 150 swimming pools. And then they have a giant full pool also in case you feel claustrophobic. In your small pool. And, and then, who are the people? Now, if you are a reporter of the kind that I am, your curiosity is not about them. It's about who are those construction workers over there. So, when I see buildings like this, all of that, I, I ask, I go and interview the workers and say, Who are you? What do you do? Who are you? So, they will say, Shetkiri, that is Yamasai. We are farmers or we are Mazdoor, agricultural laborers. Why are you here building swimming pools and not doing farming in your village? They say, Sir, where's the water? We don't have water in the village. They've abandoned agriculture because they have no water in the village and come to build your swimming pool and mine in the city. Understand how deeply your agrarian crisis is linked to inequality in resource distribution in your society. Now, RTI is done. The right to information queries made by Priyanka Kakodkar in the Times of India show us that um, cities in Maharashtra, towns and cities in Maharashtra get 400% more drinking water than villages in rural Maharashtra. Are villages less thirsty? Do they do less physical work which demands more water or more than us? Or are we the ones who are more thirsty? In your state of Tamil Nadu. By the way, that building with swimming pools, there's one coming up in Kielpok. <laughs> but Chennai, we are more refined and cultured. So we don't have one every floor, one every third floor. <laughs> <laughs> we are more restrained and cultured, refined culture, right? So that's it. Uh, our concession to our fellow human beings. If you look, for instance, if you go to say South Madras, or you go to any of the major colonies in Mailapur, Kilpaka, and wherever, sort of have to, the per capita availability of water is about 300 500 liters. In a water scarce city, as you go towards the slums, you'll find that the per capita availability is disappearing. Pudukote in summer per capita availability can be 6 liters per day in peak summer. Water has and irrigation have strong class and caste connotations. Very strong class and caste connotations. All irrigation in India has a strong caste geography as well. We can discuss that later. Want to know what the heck that means? But as water is big, okay. Another another transfer. Uh, you know all the all the newspapers for the first time write an editorial criticizing the High Court judgment when the Bombay High Court banned IPL matches in Maharashtra because they get their bloody water free. Nobody knows how many tens of thousands of liters they get. The Maharashtra Bombay High Court said, 
not in Maharashtra in this season. The, those these guys who are so terrified and can never say go to the judiciary on its worst judgments all wrote editorials, major newspapers, very ill-advised judgment because they all have money riding on, on the four thousand crores of advertising that comes out of that. They are not doing it in your interest. They are not taking their position in public interest. Now, so the water crisis with its class connotations, its caste nuances, with industry getting the bulk of water. In Sharad Pawar's own Marvel constituency, six farmers were shot dead in 2011 for protesting the diversion of water from their agriculture to industries, several of which are illegal or unlicensed industries. In Chichri Pokwad, in Pune. Okay. So this is your water crisis. It's getting worse, it's getting sharper. And rich farmer versus poor farmer, cash crop versus food crop. Hmm. What does that mean? One acre of sugar cane. Does anyone know how much water an acre of sugar cane takes? In Maharashtra, any guess? How many liters? In Maharashtra, 2% of farmers get 68% of the irrigation water. Those 2% are the sugar cane. And within that, it is the big farmer who grabs the water, not the small sugar cane farmer. Now, one acre of sugar cane, according to the government of Maharashtra's agriculture department figure, worked out by Professor Neela one acre takes 18 million liters of water. Can you fit in the idea of 18 million liters of water? To give you a sense, what is 18 million liters? 18 million liters is seven and a half Olympic sized swimming pools. You know those Olympic swimming pools that you see? Not Commonwealth Games, Olympic swimming pools. That swimming pool, seven and a half of them, takes 18 million liters. Otherwise, nine or ten Boeing P liner jets, the volume of ten Boeing P liner jets is 18 million liters. One acre of sugar. In that same one acre, oh, in that same 18 million liters, you can cultivate 12 to 15 acres of Jova. You can even cultivate 10 acres of paddy, 9 acres of paddy. So there are all kinds of water transfers taking place. In the new, in the economic reforms post 91, we coerced, 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 bullied, used credit as an instrument to push millions of small farmers away from food crop into growing cash crop. When you go to growing cash crop, your risks multiply. Your neighboring state of Kerala is an incredible example. Okay. In, in the very troubled farming district, in the very troubled tribal district of Vayana, you all heard of Vayana. Do you know what Vayana means? Vayana, the land of paddy, you can't find 20 consecutive acres of paddy in Vayana. It's all cash crop. There are a few acres, but you won't find one big paddy field in there. You grow cash crop, and in the year 2000 2001, giant agricultural concerns come to you because, and they don't tell you why. The vanilla crop collapsed in Mexico and Brazil. Now the American, America consumes 70% of the world's vanilla. India consumes 0%. We don't have an internal market for vanilla. Right? And suddenly everybody is growing, everybody and his grandmom is growing vanilla. 
Now understand this. Vanilla has no internal market. One season because somebody outside is importing, you will sell. Then what happens when Mexico and Brazil recover the next year? Then prices will crash. The prices of agricultural commodities in the world are controlled by five or six corporations in each sector. Coffee. Coffee is controlled by four major companies. Four major companies control coffee. Sarani, Nescafe, um, Starbucks and Kraft. And they keep merging, buying out each other. So even as I speak, the names of the four companies might be different. So Starbucks will be there, Nestle will be there. Now, you look, look at Tamil Nadu and look at here, this city. We still drink something which I can recognize as coffee. <laughs> but what do you do when you distribute coffee? Nescafe. Nescafe is not coffee. It's synthetics. It's made from the cheapest beans of Colombia. Because that is virtually a, colon a colony of the United States. All US coffee is mostly derived from Colombia. <coughs> do you know? They can give you a better variety of coffee. For 10 cents more per pound. But they can't do that. Why would they do that? Because the volumes they are selling, that 10 cents more means millions of dollars of profit. Don't you? So they will give you, there is no incentive to give you the better when there is so much incentive to make money from giving you the worst. So, but all our kids go about under that brand name Nescafe. Kerala produces the best Robusta coffee in the world. It's exported to Italy where it's blended and then sent to the US elsewhere. All our good Malus grow coffee and drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> and I go in the height of the agrarian crisis, coffee growers were committing suicides in large numbers. I go to the Spices Board of Kerala to discuss the agrarian crisis. They take it very seriously. Their top top official officers all are waiting to receive me at the gate. They give me a warm welcome inside with a cup of tea. <laughs> the coffee board welcomes me with a cup of tea. I'm talking about the coffee board. And I say, I'm sitting in the effing coffee board. Give me coffee. This is sir, the machine god's point. At that time, in 2004, and today the gap is even bigger. A, a kilogram of Vienna Robusta coffee was 10 to 12 times cheaper than a kilogram of Nescafe. Today, a kilogram of Nescafe is something like 15 to 16 times more costly. You're, you're paying 16 times more to drink drainage water. <laughs> what do you think Nescafe is? Right? So, this is the thing. Agricultural commodities prices are controlled by a handful of corporations across the world. It may be different companies and coffee. And by the way, agricultural inputs are controlled by a handful. One company called Monsanto controlled 30% of the global seed market. And today, and that's also a wonderful thing, Monsanto, which produced, which produced BT seed and claim, the great claim of Monsanto was that if you use our GM genetically modified BT cotton seed, you don't have to use pesticide. It doesn't require pesticide because they put the poison in the seed. <laughs> but they don't, they, it will kill them. But here's the funny thing. Just as I was coming here, Srinivasan of Hindustan Times, one young guy from Maharashtra rang up to say he wanted my comment on the fact that in the last 10 years, 
pesticide used in Maharashtra has exploded. When you are using 99% of our cotton in Maharashtra is now BT. Your pesticide usage should come down, it's going up. You are paying incredibly higher for the genetically modified seed. And you are using pesticide, it is destroying the input costs of that farm. It, and then the whole market based pricing, the philosophy of the market. That people should be free to put any prices they want. This is the, when this happened, I will leave this point and a point of credit to make. And then I will tell you what farmers are doing about it. In, in the, uh, in Vidarma, when I went first in 2003 to look at the farmer's suicide, it cost 2500 to 4000 rupees to cultivate one acre of unirrigated crop. It cost 10,000 to 12,000, 13,000 rupees to cultivate one acre of irrigated crop. Today, unirrigated cotton one acre is 15,000 to 20,000 rupees. More than 15,000. So I think you are 2013. <coughs> And irrigated cotton one acre is 45,000 rupees plus. Now, the cost of production has gone up fivefold. Has the income of the farmer gone up fivefold? Mr. Modi tells you we will double farmer's income by 2022. Hmm. They constantly avoid any mention of whether they mean doubling nominal income or real income. <laughs> Mr. Jaitley does parties in his budget speech, but he will avoid this. What do you mean by doubling? Which income? Real income? No. No, but the fact is that the production costs and input costs have gone up fivefold. Central is that is seed costs. Central in that is fertilizer cost. One bag of DAP, but of DAP, diammonia phosphate, 1991, 180 rupees. 2018, 1300 rupees. Every input has gone up massive, but not the income of the farm. So you have that as well. Credit. Why do farmers ask for loan waivers? And the farm, see the farmers ask for loan waiver because the other classes of society don't have to ask, they get it. Yeah. Every year your budget, there is a section called Statement of Revenue for God. It shows you that governments in the state, of, in, in the country, give you, governments in the country give you give the top 1% of this society more than 5 lakh crores each year in waivers, customs duty waivers, uh, excise duty waivers and direct corporate income tax waivers. You know, uh, you know what the biggest single item in customs duty waiver? All Amatmi items. Gold, diamonds and jewelry. 78,000 crores in 2014. Every year I used to write about this. So from 2015, they completely devastated that annexure in the budget. They changed the name. The earlier name was so honest. Revenue for God. Now it says, impact of assessment of tax incentives on actual revenue. <laughs> See, in, in Indians are the world we spar for national genius. One is numbers and the other is semantics. If you give five rupees to a poor person, that is a subsidy. You give five five thousand crores to Vijay Maria, that is an incentive. Right? Malia, 
Neeram, Modi, Mehul, Choksi, 30-35,000 crores between the three of them. No, do not look at this as a waiver. Now, the credit systems. 2017, have you all heard of NABAR? National Agricultural Blah Blah? Okay. They every year formulate for each state a, what is called PLCP, Potential Link Credit Plan. Maharashtra, Potential Link Credit Plan 2016 17, 53% of all agricultural credit goes to Mumbai city. Where are the farmers in Mumbai city? Where are those small struggling peasants in Kamparade and Malabar and Malabar Hill? I know two or three. One is called Mukesh, the other is called Anil, <laughs> and the third is called Baba. <laughs> okay, they get. Do you know that, uh, say, people like Professor Ramakumar of this have done studies showing where agricultural credit is going. Between the year 2000 and 2010, loans to small farmers have collapsed because banks moved towards fueling the lifestyles of the middle classes and the elite. What is? How do we know which loan is for a small farmer? If it's below 25,000 rupees, it's for a very tiny fellow. If it's below 2 lakhs, it's still for a small guy. If it's above 5 lakhs, you are talking about big farmers. But do you know that loans for below 25,000 in that decade, 2000, decade of 2000, fell from 58% of total credit to less than 10%. Which were the loans that doubled and trebled and quadrupled? Loans of 10 to 25 crores and above. So you know where the agricultural credit is going. Obviously the farmer is going to have a crisis. He can't get a loan. So he is turning to the money lender. That pressure is, then suddenly there will be a big fight and there will be some amount of credit given by the nationalized banking system. Which is to be regular and steady credit. It's only in the late 80s and 90s that this crisis begins in a very big way. Because you are diverting the resources from farmers to, to seriously the question, I will tell you the answer. Who is getting the money in Mumbai? It is the money is not going to agriculture because there are none. It's going to agri business, which to have their headquarters in Mumbai. It goes to the Rasi seeds, the Monsantos, the bunny seeds and sunny seeds and all these guys. It's agribusiness that is getting the money. Everything has been diverted towards the corporations, land, water, seeds, fertilizer. Fertilizer subsidy is a producer subsidy, not a consumer subsidy. For 30 years. Here's the point. Here is your agrarian crisis. Five words. What is the agrarian crisis? Five words. The corporate hijack of Indian agriculture. The corporate hijack of Indian agriculture. What is the process by which, what the process by which that hijack is achieved? Professor Nagaraj put it in five words. Predatory commercialization of the countryside. You were spending 2500 rupees on cultivating one acre, now it's 16,000. 18,000. Predatory commercialization of the countryside. Three, what is the consequence or outcome? Understand this the farm suicides are not the agrarian crisis. They are its consequence, not its cause. They are its outcome, not its origin. The, 
consequently, outcome of that, the outcome of this crisis, in five words, greatest, the greatest, the greatest displacement in our history. 15 million people thrown out of the occupation in 20 years. Greatest displacement in our history. This is your crisis. And there are lots of things lots of us can do, but let me tell you what the farmers are doing, what I hope you will do, and how we can go about it. In, Mar in November this year, by the way, in, Ju in, uh, in July 15th, July 14th this year, 201 farmers' organizations, including prominently the All India Kisan Sama. These organizations made a call November 28th to 30th, a giant march on Parliament. No skulls in Jantar Mantar, encircled Parliament. It's a democratic march with democratic demands. In fact, I think it's the height of a democratic protest. What are they asking for? They are asking for a special session of the Indian Parliament. Three week session exclusively to discuss and debate the agrarian crisis and its related issues. Agrarian crisis and related issues. Why do they, why do they call it, I mean why three weeks? What are those related issues? If you deliver three weeks, let's say 21 days, let's say three days, you discuss and debate the Swaminathan or National Commission of Farmers. Three days you discuss that. Three days you discuss those pending issues, pending agenda of land reform. And I have been saying this everywhere. It's not what the everything I've said has been very popular with the farmers except one demand of mine. You haven't a chance of solving your agrarian crisis if you do not engage with and assert the rights of those who do the bulk of work in Indian agriculture, the rights and entitlements of women farmers. Dalit farmers and Adivasi farmers, which of course would bring in your Forest Rights Act. But three days discuss those rights of that women farm. Three days you discuss the credit system. Incidentally, not many people know that there were more loan waivers in colonial India than in independent India. And in colonial India, there were no nationalized banks. There were only private money lenders. 1934, Punjab Alienation and Indebtedness Act. 1937, Madras Presidency passed a similar act. Though the British Raj, the Sahukars, the money lenders were class. Nonetheless, the British Raj deserted them when it saw revolt and rebellion. The only attempt at such a law was in Kerala when Professor Prabhat Patai was Deputy Chairman of the State Planning Board. He created a law, crafted along those lines. And Kerala actually emerged significantly from its crisis. So it will go back again because of the cash crop problem. It's very serious. Now, three days to discuss the credit systems that should come. The, the idea of particular regions having low interest or no interest also. China had a no interest zone where farmers paid back the principal. Three days, let's discuss the mega water crisis. Let's debate and decide who, who owns this water fundamental right. Or does it belong to the IPL for free and the farmers at one rupee a litre 
or whatever the cost is. Who and you decide on what are these tens of thousands of bottled companies simply taking public water, putting it in plastic bottles and giving it to you for 20 rupees a liter. See, by the way, this is a generational thing. My great grandmother and grandmother, they had a sense of where water came from. And all of us are great grandmothers. When it rained, they put the buckets and vessels outside. Or they went to the stream or the nearest well. My generation grew up thinking water comes out of a tap. So if there is a tap, there is water. The young generation here, your generation has grown up thinking water grows in plastic bottles. So we need to educate ourselves on how central this life giving resources. What do we have to do? Three days discussion on the mega water crisis. Three days discussion on those pending issues of land reform. You have a three day discussion. What kind of agriculture do we want 20, 30 years from now? Will it be community driven or corporate driven? Now, the wonderful thing these guys say, we don't need, we should have so many people in agriculture. You can remove 40% of them. That's what Mr. Naidu's vision 2020 plan had. And he did succeed in throwing a lot of millions of people off agriculture. But where did they go? What did you offer them? Your displaced farmer is going to be recruited by Infosys. <laughs> well, actually he is. You can find them. Some displaced farmers from Pandya and uh, Assad. I mean, you can see some of them working in the Infosys canteen, giving you your chai. Earlier they were giving you your food. Earlier they were giving you your food. Now they'll serve you your chai. You haven't created one job as an organization, but you're going to take tens of millions of people off of agriculture. You're going to create 30, some of the largest number of mega cities in the world are coming up in India. There are already, by the way, 53 urban agglomerations in India, including 46 cities, which have a population of more than 1 million, 4 which have, 5 which have a population of more than 10 million. You are going to end up with 20, 30 cities of 20 million and above, of 20. You are not able to cope with your present population. Imagine the urban nightmare and collapse when you have 25, 30 million people in India. What happens to your water resources? How do you deal with health? How do you deal with all of this? So you discuss what kind of agriculture do we want now? You, you know, oh, we can we can raw raise production with BT and GM, and all very wonderful. Except that it actually hasn't happened. Yet. If you look at cotton production in Vidarbha, it's been in a state of collapse for three years now. The BT, BTC, the BT cotton has proved completely vulnerable to pest. So much so that Monsanto has twice withdrawn its own product. Bolgar 1 was removed. They admitted that it has become susceptible to pink bookworm. But there's a larger philosophical question. I am arguing that you are growing your agriculture, we are proceeding on a particular system. One farmer told me once, suppose you take two brothers, twin brothers, same age, same sex, same height, same weight, same height, and both are doing the same work, they are laborers for the village. Let us put one of those brothers, twin brother A, on his regular diet, whatever his society has been feeding him for centuries. The second brother, let us pump him with steroids. Who is, whose output is going to be better? The guy on steroids for six years. 
and then twin brother B is dead and twin brother A is still going where he was going. We are running Indian agriculture on steroids and much of the soil fertility loss issues come from that, from the amount of chemicals, from the amount of, you know, poisonous substances we put into the earth. You know what? Um, one of the things that economists, one of the millions of things that mainstream economists can never get into their heads. You know, if you look at the world, again, I'm, I'm ending where I started on the nature of our economics. You know, they, they look at, those who look at everything in input and output do not recognize in agriculture between input and output is a living being called soil with billions of living organisms in it. If you kill those, your input output calculations will go wrong. They cannot be right. You cannot poison the soil and indefinitely increase your output. What are the soil fertility loss rates across India now? There are states where it's about 30 percent, maybe even 35 percent, but at least 20, 25 percent across the country. Huge loss of soil fertility for the kind of stuff we are pumping the soil with. We are running agriculture on steroids. What, do you do? what kind of agriculture do you want? All of us, by the way, are eating poison. And you can see the number of cancers going up in society. All of that which happens from the water we drink. Because our pesticides also contaminate the water. They contaminate the water in which the crops are grown. They contaminate the water which we drink. Because it gets into the streams and the water resources. So three days and three days of that session. No journalists, no experts, no lobbyists, no Niti IO. For three days, let the actual victims of the agrarian crisis stand on the central hall of parliament, the floor of the Senate, and let them tell the nation what the agrarian crisis means to them. Believe me, that is one time the nation wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> so this march that is coming in June, last on 22nd August, all of us from the middle classes, middle class doctors, lawyers, techies, we all got together in Delhi. We sent invitations to 35, 50 people, 200 people came and spent a whole day from 10 a.m. to 5 30. Thinking, how can we make ourselves relevant to the farmers when they march on Delhi? So we formed an informal network. It's called nation for farmers and within that there will be multi-sectoral platforms doctors for farmers lawyers for farmers techies for farmers okay software engineers for farmers or whatever you want to call it <coughs> teachers for farmers students for farmers those are the banners not parties and banners but those banners I want to see every one of us march on Delhi between 20. The idea is that everybody comes to within 60, 60 to 100 kilometers of Delhi. They get down within 60, 100 kilometers of Delhi and they march. The first organization, the first, and I need to do this, the first organization to make this call was the All India Kisan Sabha. It's very important that they do it because the greatest farmers march of the last 20-30 years was organized by the All India Kisan Sabha from Nashik to Mumbai this March 6th to March 12th. It was one of the most moving things that I have ever been like, you know, and associated with. 40,000 Poorest farmers, Adivasis, mainly. 90% of the marchers, 80%, did not own footwear. In 40 degrees heat, 38 degrees overhead, 
marching on the highway and the hills so that it's 40 degrees on your feet on the top they came with their souls slit open bleeding do you know how there were 68 year old woman who was at the front of it her name is Rukma Bai do you know how they coped do you know how they coped with the bleeding how they coped with the heat on the feet the activists in the march brought what scores and scores of rolls of cellotape and they cellotaped their feet they bandaged their feet with cellotapes and marched to Mumbai to make their demands when they started in Nashik they could have been 15,000, 12,000 everywhere along the way poor farmers joined them their demands were around the Forest Rights Act over MSP over all these issues by the time they reached Mumbai Azad Maidan 50,000. 40,000 when they entered Mumbai. When they entered Mumbai, look at what these people did. They won over the heart of a city that has very little time for me. They, they won over the heart of that city. On March 11th, they entered the inner perimeter of Mumbai. Later, late evening, maybe on the night of 11th, they were exhausted after 170 kilometers of march and they still had 12-15 kilometers. They were scheduled to march those 12-15 kilometers the next morning. Instead, they took a decision, we will march in the night and we will march silently. Because lakhs of children would be going for their board exams the next morning. And they didn't want to disturb the children's sleep and they didn't want to disturb their exams by creating traffic jams. And 40,000 people marched in silence at midnight without raising a single slogan. It was an incredible sight. Imagine 40,000 people moving in silence through the great metropolis of Mumbai. They reached Azad Maidan by 6 a.m. No traffic jams. The children have had a peaceful sleep and go for their exams without it. When I asked one of the women, why did you do this? Look at your feet. Shouldn't you have rested and come? And they said, our children also write exams. Why should we destroy the their children's exams. Yeah. In doing that, the farmers were reaching out to you. They were reaching out to the middle classes. They were asking us, you know, support us. And I saw something that I had not seen for 34 years in Mumbai. I saw the middle classes come out. KEM doctors came and set up a stand. These doctors, I don't think we called them. They came, they set up a stand and they were treating all these cut and bleeding feet. Doctors were there to do that. Some guy, businessman in the Crawford Market or wherever, he comes and he gives 1,000 pairs of footwear, chapels. Because he saw on TV that they are marching without chapels. They don't own any. 1,000 pairs of chapels. I saw a guy come in a BMW with a few thousand sachets of water. Thank you. People came and distributed food packets. They were, of course, what the organizers arranged. But there were an incredible number of people who were not arranged, who were not called for. They just came out. I'm saying, can we come out like that at the national level? These 40,000 poor farmers showed us what could be done. For me, they were the inspiration of the idea. That's when I wrote an article saying, let's have a march on Delhi. And then these 200, the colony of Kisan Sabha immediately endorsed that call. It's not my march, it's theirs. 
It's the march of the 201 organization. We should not take over the march, but as the, the professional middle classes, we should take these other demands. They are the marching on the MSP, they are marching on the loan issue, waiver issue. We should add to it this larger democratic phase of special session of parliament. Those two rules, those two bills which they have formulated, we will place them on parliament and do it. But let us also bring up the issues of water, the democratic issues of why maybe we can demand a minimum percentage of every budget has to be devoted to agriculture. Right? We can, you can demand the price stabilization fund. Let it be like a consolidated fund. A constitution. But let's have, remember, when lakhs of farmers go to parliament, we are asking every member of parliament who agrees with these demands to join the march. And incidentally, the Chief Minister of Delhi, Arvind Kejriwal, has declared his support for the march and said he will meet the marchers at the borders of Delhi and escort them into his city. I'm saying that if a hundred MPs come forward, yeah. and by the way, we cannot be the frontliners of the march. I'm saying that the women of the kind who led that march from Nashik to Mumbai, those women should be at the front lines of the march. They should be the face of the march, and we will be holding when that when they come a press conference where they will address the judges and the media. You know, I think great changes are upon us. Our choice is, will those changes take place within our concept or outside it? If they will take place within our concept, we must engage, interact, see that what is a glorious democratic protest becomes a historic one where you will tell your grandchildren, I was in that much. Thank you.